Well, hello. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Dean Paulet, and I'd like to review some experimentation I've done with cross-flow fans for hovercraft propulsion a few years ago. As you may have guessed, I'm not a member of the Hover Club of Great Britain. I'm, in fact, a member of the Hover Club of America since 1977. Uh, my hovercraft affliction started in 1976 with this aero car. Um, it was a uh, plan set from the back of a popular mechanics magazine, and I built this with my father. It had a fabric hull, a seven horsepower lift engine, driving a two-bladed lift propeller, and at first a three and a half horsepower engine for thrust, and then a 20 horsepower chaparral two-stroke later on, which had a simple sea skirt um, with a rope in the bottom. I never dared run it on water. Um, I was into control line airplanes at the time, so I thought this was a good idea for some reason. So about 40 some years later, I'm on craft number 10, and this one has some unique features you might not be familiar with or see too often in the UK. I'd like to discuss just a few of those before I get into the, um, the cross little fan section. This is a video from last year on Lake Michigan. Um, this craft has a 17 feet long foam and fiberglass hull, got a subtech style skirt, and it has the uh, UH design centrifugal lift system, which I rebuilt out of modern parts. And it's all powered by a EA81 Subaru engine. Um, this happens to be about the best conditions I've ever had on Lake Michigan. Uh, just 22,000 square miles of mill pond water. It's, it's the perfect day. More typically, it's a half meter to a one meter seas. And if it's windy, you get five meter seas out there. And I stay home. And I also want to apologize for uh, not everything is in SI units. Some of it's still in Imperial units. Um, hard as we've tried for the past 50 years, we've not been able to master the SI system in the US. Um, so one thing on this craft is it has a uh, centrifugal lift fan. It's a home-built fan, uh, backwards curved airfoil blades, 32-inch diameter. The discs and rings are 6061 aluminum and riveted to that are blades made of 50, 52 uh, quarter hard marine grade aluminum, which is formable so you can bend the blades. And inside the blade, because they're hollow, the airfoil shape in between is a... Uh, a spar made of plascor, which is like a honeycomb plastic. If you're not familiar with a septech style skirt, this is what it looks like if you flip it over. Um, the sides and the rear are bag skirts, and the bow skirt and this partition skirt are a conical shape. It's a section of a cone, so it inflates and maintains its shape. It's fed, it's a partial flow bag system. So where it says fan discharge ports, that's where the majority of the lift fan air comes out. And then there's two bag fill ports on either side. And really the new bit on this skirt, which is different from a SEFTEC, is that this has a baffle in the back over there on the right. That divides the bag sections into left and right. And I have cockpit controls that can uh, control how much airflow goes into those bags. So at low speeds, you can completely deflate one side or the other and make it uh, turn around on a dime pretty much. Uh, th the reason for that partition skirt is to get a high pitch stiffness. Um, when the airflow enters the rear cushion, it then leaks underneath that partition skirt and inflates the bow section. And the, the cushion pressure in the rear is higher than it is in the front. That also helps keep down spray. But when you say, for instance, pitch the craft nose down, the pressure in the bow section will increase because the bow skirt is sealing better than it had before. So it, like a normal or a automatically compensating trim system. So it's not very sensitive to center of gravity fore and aft. This is the auto lift system. Um, this was patented by Bob Wint of Universal Hovercraft back in the 1970s. And the, the main reason for it is to maintain a more um, 
uh, more steady lift fan speed, even though the engine RPM is changing once you get above fast idle. Um, this system kind of died out in the 1980s when the Salisbury company quit making the, the pulleys that were needed. Um, so when I started out to do is I built a math model in Excel of how the thing works with all the friction between the belt and the pulley faces and the centrifugal forces on the belt and the cams and so on to figure out how it was going to shift so I could design new parts. So this new system uses um, secondary clutches from a Ski-Doo snowmobile, which are readily available with some different cams in there and after, well, springs that I designed myself for the bottom one. So the way this thing works is that driver pulley, the lower one, is connected to the engine crankshaft and inside of there is a spring which is always trying to compress the two face plates together. And the upper one has a cam in it. Uh, so the more torque it senses, the harder it squeezes together. And there's also a slight torsion spring in there that kind of starts the whole thing up to provide it a little bit of friction to start with. So at low engine speeds, it runs in this um, configuration, the way you see it there, it's overdriving the lift fan because that sec the driven pulley runs faster than the one on the engine. And as you speed the engine up, the fan torque will increase and the top one starts clamping down and it changes the ratio and it holds it more steady. In addition to that, that would work, all it does work all by itself, but in addition to that, there's a bias system on there. And if you look at the black cylinder, which is a, a gas spring, gas strut, it pushes on that lever up there and I can control where it pushes on that lever. So it can either add or subtract force from the spring in the lower pulley. And that way you can bias the lift fan up or down. Here's some test data comparing the uh, fan RPM versus the engine RPM. Uh, the red is when it's biased to high uh, blue is where it runs normally. Almost 99% of the time it runs, I just leave it alone with no bias at all. And the green one is low bias. And the craft lifts off with the lift fan running about 800 RPM or so. It's just a less than two horsepower actually to make it hover. Um, so if you're trying to go through a marina or a no wake zone, you don't want to spray everybody, you, uh, set that down to low bias and that lets you get up to 2500 or so engine rpm so you can maneuver around at about uh, five miles per hour in boating mode so let's go on to uh cross little fans um, inspiration for this kind of started early i was always a big fan as a teenager in the 70s looking through the jane's surface skimmers and i always liked the cc7 from cushion craft and a couple of years ago, I went to a trip to the uh, Hovercraft Museum at Lee on Solent. And they had some nice models there, which you can see the pictures of here, and also an actual CC7. Like the clean lines, the, the quietness, supposedly, of the, uh, the centrifugal propulsion system. Universal Hovercraft also had a uh, centrifugally powered hovercraft, the UH-17C from the early 1970s. This was powered by a Corvair engine. I think about 140 horsepower or so. And if you ever need a good laugh, watch Murderer's Row. It's a Matt Helm movie. It's a spoof on James Bond uh, with Dean Martin and I think that's Anne Margaret. Uh, it featured the CC5 and a SRN6 in it. So one thing I didn't like about the uh, centrifugal fans was that all the flow turning that's involved when you uh, start moving forward, you know, Flow has to go in, turn 90 degrees to get into the fan, and then gets flung around out the exhaust and into the uh, cushion. So I was looking at using a cross flow fan instead. So this is just the concept on a, a notional hovercraft. It's not a real hull yet or anything. There'd be two fans, a left and a right one, driven independently by a common engine. And the, little, the rudders are in back there. If you look at a cross section of one, it looks something like this. And the top view is for forward thrust. So air comes in from the left, goes transversely through the rotor, 
and then out the discharge in the back. And for reverse thrust, you have a, there's a blocker door, which blocks the normal exit and also exposing the um, reverser cascade at the same time up on top. Let's see, this is uh, kind of intended, well, I should point out that the, uh, the nozzle, if you look in the upper picture, uh, there's an arrow there for the hinge point. And what that lets you do is control the exit area of the fan. And by throttling down the exit area, you can decrease the thrust and also decrease the power required to drive it. And that way you can modulate the thrust. The idea is that on a single engine craft, you would set your um, engine RPM for the amount of lift airflow that you'd want, and then modulate your thrust left and right independently using these nozzles and also reverse. And the maximum discharge area when it's up at 11 inches of height as it's shown there in the top, uh, for both fans combined is about six square feet. And it's the same as a uh, 2.8 foot diameter circular duct or 85 centimeters. So early CFD work with us. Uh, is playing around with the blade angles and where those cutoffs are, uh, the number of blades and so on. And there's two, at least at first, there were two chambers. Uh, this primary vortex chamber and the red one on the right was a secondary vortex chamber. And those are areas where the air can recirculate. So those parts there, they're not doing much um, when the airflow is going through. I should also point out that the closest relative of the cross flow fan is probably the uh, forward curve centrifugal fan, except the air doesn't come in the ends of the fan as it does on the centrifugal. It goes through the fan twice. So when the air comes in, it first it passes through the, the blades one time, and not much really happens there. Most of the energy addition happens when it goes out the last time at the bottom. And this vortex, you can see there is the, the blue one, the dark blue one, the secondary vortex. This happened to be with the reverser active. When it's not active, it moves up a little bit and gets out of the way of the discharge there. Uh, the secondary vortex, when I was experimenting, um, getting rid of it actually helped reduce the noise. You also see that within the four red circles, uh, those are called cutoffs. That's where the housing gets near the, uh, the rotor blades. And that's where uh, noise can emanate from. I'm going to point out that this kind of fan is very poor at generating static pressure. So using it for a lift is probably not a good idea. It's great at making dynamic pressure, but not so much static. Um, in the fan terminology, it's got low reaction to it. So like all good things, you uh, start off by making models to experiment and learn even more. So this is the original model, the little one. Um, the fan system is on the, the right and the pink or uh, yellow styrofoam housings there. And then on the left side, we have an electric motor, which is from a treadmill. And you might notice that the motor is mounted in a system of bearings. So, um, when there's torque applied to the motor, it could just spin if it weren't for that lever sticking out the side of it and resting on top of that scale. So that's how I measure the torque on it. And there's also a, a reflector on the coupling so I can use a laser tachometer to, uh, to get the RPM. So in this horizontal position, um, I'm measuring noise and looking at the shaft power by measuring the torque and the RPM. And also mount it vertically and set the whole thing on a scale to read the thrust. So it just blasts up and hits the ceiling of my shop. Here's some initial data from the model. If you look at the, the sloping lines, the, uh, the blue, the purple, the red, those are the um, relative thrust and relative horsepower as you change the nozzle area. So 
the horizontal axis is the nozzle opening and the vertical axis is the percentage of thrust or power, depending on which curve it is, from the 100% size. So you can see that as you pinch down the nozzle area, the power goes down dramatically also. It's not like an axial flow fan where the power remains constant more or less, or maybe even goes up. So this allows you to throttle your well, throttle the exhaust to modulate your thrust without really being very inefficient. So one way of measuring how efficient a rotor is at uh, producing thrust is this, what I call it, a, it's a figure of merit. And if you look at the very bottom equation, uh, static thrust equals this figure of merit times the diameter, if it were circular, diameter of your fan exhaust in feet times the horsepower applied all raised to the two thirds power. So this kind of takes out the disc loading or power loading of the, uh, the systems. So every is, everything's on an even balance. Um, you can't really compare a helicopter rotor to a jet engine in terms of efficiency without taking something like that into account. And the best possible number for this figure of merit, this has units to it. So the best possible number is this 13.12. That would be if you converted 100% of the shaft power in the fan into kinetic energy in the slipstream. And it all has to be of uniform velocity, incompressible flow, um, probably some other stipulations too, I'm forgetting, but that would be the perfect rule, no swirl. And if you have an open air propeller, this figure of merit is somewhere around seven and a quarter. Um, Ducted propellers or ducted fans are up in the eight and a half to nine range. So this model is up above the ducted propeller range, actually, you know, between uh, nine, uh, eight and a half and nine or so. So this figure of merit also happens to be directly related to this energy conversion number where you're converting shaft power into kinetic energy in the slipstream. That formula is also down there where the and you have to have units. So the, in this case, the density is in imperial units, slugs per cubic foot. <laughs> so 0 0.002378 slugs per cubic foot is sea level, or like 1.23 kilograms per meter cube, I think is the same. So things are looking pretty good performance wise, but noise wise was a different story. Uh, and in fact, I think I made a siren. It was horrible, it was just a, a shrill, horrible sounding device. So I started going down the path of trying different blade shapes. Uh, the picture on the left shows three of the different ones. I made four total, but the one in the middle looked kind of the same. So the one on the left was the original. The blades are straight. So that means that they cut through the wake of these cutoffs all at the same time. And all the blades are uniformly spaced. There's 27 blades uh, and uniform spacing or pitch between all of them. Then I went to this random spacing and skewed the blades too. So in the middle rotor, uh, the top of one blade is directly above the bottom of the adjacent one. So it's got one pitch skew to it. And the blades are also spaced randomly. So there's no, um, no regular pace of blades going by these cutoffs. And another variation on the, and I had two levels of randomness on that middle one that I made. The one on the right also has the skew, but the pitch varies in a sinusoidal fashion five times around. And that was also tested. And different housing treatments were also tried. So um, the four black arrows show where the cutoffs are. At this point, it still had, this is that secondary vortex chamber. It was still in place. So I tried various things like uh, serrations, and rounding them off and things. So I tried a whole bunch of different things and took noise measurements during all of this. And I'm gonna play a, a bit or an audio clip here. And this is going to be uh, the three different rotors. The first one is the uniform one, the one on the left, then the sine wave uh, spacing, which is the one on the right. And finally the random tone, which is in the middle.
you might remember from Keith Oakley's talk, he took a lot of measurements and broke it down into the frequency domain. So this is the original rotor that had no skew and uniform blade spacing at 3,500 RPM. And each one of those spikes that sticks up, uh, the one on the left is the blade passing frequency. So at about 1,572 times per second, a blade comes by. And then there's harmonics of that two times, three times, and four times, and so on. And these very defined peaks give it a very shrill sound. Then switching to the random rotor with one pitch skew, you can see that the, the well-defined peaks are gone. It's turned more into a, like a white noise. And it's a lot less harsh sounding and it's also quite a bit quieter in uh, absolute decibels. So unfortunately, a lot of these treatments to, uh, to get rid of the noise, especially the ones that you do to the cutoffs, also affect thrust. So to compare one system to the other, one configuration to the other, it's only fair to plot the noise against thrust developed instead of, say, RPM or something like that. So you can get a, a fair comparison. So the worst offender was the, uh, the blue baseline one on top. And you can, <laughs> This was measured 10 feet away, and it was over 100 decibels inside. It was, it was really bad. The, uh, the quietest one was this green one, which had a lot of, um, let's see, a lot of gap between the, uh, the cutoffs and the rotor blades. Unfortunately, it also didn't make much thrust, and you would have had to increase the RPM beyond reasonable limits to make that viable. So the one I finally went with was this, this other blue one with the stars. And that had a, a lesser gap and a bigger um, radius on one of the inlet cutoffs. I'm gonna switch now to uh, starting the uh, design of the full scale fan. So I looked at three things, basically structural concerns. Number one, is just the, uh, the stresses involved due to centrifugal force and the aerodynamic loads. And this is why I picked two rotors. So each one can be driven from the center by the same engine, but each one only has to carry half the torque. If you had one long rotor, then the torque at one end would be double what it is now, right? Because on this one end sees the whole torque and the other end has nothing because it's been dissipated into the, uh, into the airstream. Uh, the other critical concern is buckling of the blades. Uh, they have to be stiff enough in order to resist bowing out and, and flexing over like stepping on an aluminum can. Uh, most of us have probably tried that. And trying to predict buckling is always kind of scary because there's so many unknowns involved. So trying to shoot for a, a buckling load factor of about five on this. Um, so try and keep it fairly safe. And thirdly is the uh, dynamics of the, the rotor. So, so we have torsional vibration modes that we have to be concerned about if we're gonna drive this with an internal combustion engine. I'm gonna op or talk about that a little bit more later on. So this mode that's shown here is, if, is, is as if the, uh, the left end, the blue end is fixed and you took the other end on the right, twisted it and then let go. And what frequency would that thing oscillate at? One thing I didn't look at was uh, blade flutter because it's very complicated. So I just kind of hoped for the best and it, it did turn out in the end, but that is a concern though. Did some materials testing to make the blades. Um, various composites, I'll have a table coming up uh, to compare them, but a little very simple test rig. So for, um, Stiffness, I just did a cantilever beam on a scale on the left picture. And for flexural strength to failure, I just had a three point bending test where um, you put your sample up on top, pull down the middle with a scale, and watch what happens. So I looked at about eight different materials in the FEA models. Um, 
any anywhere from carbon cloth with a, uh, a wooden core to this solid aluminum or solid steel. And again, I was trying to keep this buckling load factor above five and then comparing the weight and the natural frequency that, that developed from all these things. So in the end, I went with um, this nine ounce fiberglass cloth and a uh, 0.06 inch basswood core, then another layer of fiberglass cloth. Ended up being near, nearly the lightest and it's also the cheapest to build. Um, I should point out though that some of these like on the top, a carbon cloth and then the basswood core and another carbon cloth, although in the end, it could probably be a lighter and more rigid system. Uh, the layup itself was too thick and it was overdone, really. The uh, the bucking load factor is up like tw almost 20. It didn't need to be that strong. So I could have backed off on the thickness of the carbon cloth, but I didn't have all the samples I needed, you know, material wise. So in the end, number three, it was. Here's a... Uh, sequence of assembling the blades and i made these on a wooden mold that came off of templates that i made uh, from my cad system so starting from the top we have the the lower half of the mold this is the convex part it's also got twist in it and camber all molded at the same time uh, the first thing to go down is some release ply and the layer one layer of the nine ounce bi-directional cloth and then third one down is the, the basswood core, just a um, sheet of, of wood, essentially. And it's piloted on those pins on the end that locates everything. Uh, then some more cloth, more release ply, then the upper half of the mold and clamps. I did one of these every night for 27 days straight in my basement. A few more construction photos. Uh, upper left is the rotor being assembled. So I had a fixture that held the discs and the ring in the middle, the stiffening ring, in proper relation to each other. Uh, so that included both the, uh, the one blade pitch of skew and the parallelism to it. Uh, picture on the right is making the, the integral dry shift. This is bonded on the end of the rotor. So I'm cutting the, the, uh, the V-belt groove in there too big to run on my lathe, so I had to resort to something like that. And on the bottom there is the finished rotor, about 40 inches, just over a meter long, and 24 inch diameter. And sitting on top is one of the, the scale models, which is about 15% size. This is hot wiring the housings. So I made templates for the ends, you folks are probably familiar with this. And you have a, a piece of stainless steel wire and run current through it. It makes it hot and you can slice the foam like a hot knife through butter. Now, if you want to drill holes, one trick I learned was that you could take a uh, soldering iron heating element, connect it to some wires and mount the whole thing in a weight and drop it down from a string. So you can get very uh, straight and circular holes by this. You can drill a long distance like that. First, I tried uh, just taking a, a ball of bearing and getting it red hot and dropping it in, but invariably it wouldn't keep its heat long enough and gets stuck in the middle. <clears throat> so a lot of this testing I did was with an electric drive. Um, you can see there it's a five horsepower electric motor with a variable speed controller and the whole thing is mounted on this this frame so I can wheel it around. Um, electric drive is nice. You can run it indoors, although it blows everything off the walls, but you can blow, you can run it inside. Um, it's a lot quieter uh, and it's very steady test conditions. You can control the RPM of the motor very precisely and you can get better data with that. And even though it's five, just five horsepower, let me test up to about 60% of the full RPM that it was designed for. Uh, this is how you measure the thrust. Uh, so you spin the frame from four straps, the green straps from the ceiling, and you tie the, uh, the bottom down 
and you turn it on and it'll swing forward a little bit. And then you take a tension scale and pull it back to the original position. And when you get, get back to that position, that's your thrust. And one thing wasn't obvious to me at first, but um, after thinking about it sometime, it did make sense. At first, I was going to set it up like the diagram on the on the top right with a triangle from a single point, and just let it swing. But when you do that, if you don't know precisely where the thrust line is, and you put the scale somewhere that's not exactly on the thrust line, you're going to get inaccurate reading. So if you mount it with all the strands vertical, it gets rid of that problem. It doesn't matter where the, the thrust line is, and your tension reading will be correct. So here's some performance data with the electric drive. Um, one thing to note is that the if you look at the exhaust velocity, the, the green line up on top, it's about 70 feet per second or so. And the tip speed at this RPM is only 43 feet per second. So the air comes out faster than the tip speed of the rotor, which is interesting. Um, if you scale it up to full power, the tip speed is about uh, 70 feet per second or 21 meters per second. And the fan power is in red. So at uh, full opening, it takes the most power and it was drawing about three and a half horsepower. And the thrust was increasing to about 40 pounds of force at, at maximum opening. And horsepower is calculated by uh, measuring the electrical power input to the controller. Uh, the controller is very efficient. Even at full power, hardly any heat comes out, I think. It couldn't have been more than 10 watts of power loss in the controller. And then at, uh, at work, we have serv several very good motor engineers, and I developed a motor model with these guys and uh, to get the shaft power out versus electrical power in, and also subtracted out the, uh, the belt losses by measuring the, the tear friction to rotate the, the assembly. So if you calculate this figure of merit again, um, the full size fan did better than the model. That's pretty typical. Usually when you go bigger um, with a higher Reynolds number, like a boundary layer scaling number, um, performance gets better. And there's also the fact that your build clearances are typically better on something big, like your, uh, your accuracy versus the size of the thing becomes easier to do when it gets big. So, it's doing pretty good. Um, now we're up to a figure of merit of between 10 and 11 compared to a ducted propeller of eight and a half to nine. And it looks like the uh, the full size, well, it is full size, but when you put two fans together, it should develop about 215 pounds of thrust using 30 horsepower. So one thing, that happened with the reverse thrust was that um, the flow, when it comes out of those reverser veins in the bottom right picture, imagine it shooting um, over to the right, the, the uh, impeller is throwing the air to the left and then the reverser veins throw it back. It was sticking, the flow was sticking to that upper inlet due to this Kawanda effect as they call it. It's a air trying to follow a, a surface like that convex surface. So it required putting a, it was, well, it was affecting the, the amount of reverse thrust you could get. So the, the fix for that was to put this trip strip on there and it tried to hold a bunch of different configurations of uh, where it was located and how high it was. And this number five in the end was the best. Uh, that's since, since been built right into the, uh, the upper housing inlet there. So it's not an aluminum strip anymore, it's built in. Let me back up one time. Um, so you end up getting about 70% reverse thrust compared to forward thrust, the same amount of power. Um, but what happens is the, the extra flow resistance um, to the air when it goes through the cascade or cascade veins also applies more back pressure on the, on the rotor. And when that happens, the flow decreases somewhat. So if you look at the blue bars in the, in the graph, you get about 43% of your forward thrust at the same RPM. So it's still fairly good.
Next was to take, next step was to take it outside, and on the bottom right is a it's to scale. So is my workshop, and where the fan is, and which direction it's blowing. And it took readings um, at different positions. Um, did this in collaboration with Keith Oakley. He told me the uh, the system is done over in the UK with the noise measurements. So I'm trying to follow what you guys did. And this one, this fan does not show a cone of silence like uh, typical fans do. It's actually quietest on the sides and it's loudest in the front and a little bit louder, a little less loud in the rear. Uh, there's a lot of numbers up there, but I think the only one to really take away from it for now is the uh, is the one that's circled up there in the top left. Um, so at full frequency, um, actually I should point out that when it says frequency up there, that's the electrical frequency going to the motor, not any kind of noise frequency. So at, at full speed, 60 hertz, uh, nozzle fully open, 25 meters, the average for all those readings was 59.4 dB. But that's not running full power. So he took a bunch of that test data and fits some curves to it using the uh, typical industrial fan scaling laws. So if you change the speed of it, so if you're running faster, if you look at the equation N2 over N1, take that ratio, take the logarithm of it, multiply by 50, and that's the number of added decibels compared to N1 that you have to add. So if you extrapolate that, that's the uh, three curves there. If you take the 25 meter line, which is the green, if you extrapolate all the way to 670 RPM, which is the, the rated RPM, you're at about 74 dB. Uh, but one thing you have to do is add the second fan. So when you double the amount of sound power being generated, it's approximately three dB louder. So that gets us up to about 77 decibels on the A scale. Uh, and again, that's 215 pounds of thrust and 30 horsepower. So unfortunately, this fell short of the, the EU regulation for uh, recreational boats, but it's still pretty quiet. So you got some videos now of it running. Here's another one, um, doing some smoke tests. The main reason for using the smoke is to play with smoke bombs. There's really no technical reason, it just looks cool. Exhaust velocity is about 81 miles per hour, 36 meters per second. This is running at full rated RPM. And one more for reverse thrust. Not too much of the flow is sticking to the inlet anymore as it was originally. Um, one thing I'd like to talk about a little bit is um, rotor drives. Um, I've seen a lot of craft, at least in the U.S. here, sometimes they, uh, they have trouble breaking belts or crankshafts or fan shafts or blades even. Um, a lot of this is due to torsional vibration. Um, if you think of a very simple system where you have two inertias in the upper left, if you took one of them, grabbed one of those discs in one hand, and 
grab the other one, twist the shaft, let go of both of them at the same time, those two inertias would oscillate one against the other. That's one mode of vibration that that system would have. In, the, in a real hovercraft, um, those inertias are things like the engine flywheel, along with the pistons, um, the drive sheaves on the engine and the fan, the rotor itself. So in this case, it's got a long rotor. So the inertia is essentially distributed over its length, not concentrated in one spot. And springs are things like couplings you might have between the engine and the fan. And the drive belts themselves are a little bit stretchy. You know, every time the engine fires, the belt stretches a little bit. Um, and the rotor again has is a, a spring also. So the uh, first two modes for this fan, this fan rotor, if you had one end fixed and the other end free, like I was showing earlier, that's 18 hertz it oscillated at. If you have both ends free, it's higher. It's 33.8 hertz. So if we take a, if you took a engine, uh, for instance, this one I showed in the bottom here, it's a, a four stroke 90 degree V twin that's running at 3,600 RPM. So most of these V twins they only have one crank throw on them. So they're, that means that they're odd firing. And I also want to point out that this is not an actual um, vibration spectrum of one of these engines. It's what you get if you add, um, use a, a sine wave for the power stroke that lasts 180 degrees and add these together. So if you're running at 3,600 RPM, you get 60 power strokes per second. So there's two cylinders and that makes 60 Hertz. So the fundamental frequency over there, if you look at the scale in the bottom is at 60 Hertz and ignore the vertical scale. It's really meaningless in here, the way this is done. So you have that, but because the engine doesn't fire in even intervals, it fires at 270 and 540 degrees of rotation. Um, that happens every two revolutions that repeats, right? So you get one complete cycle every 720. So that means you get these side bands that are spaced at 30 Hertz away from the fundamental, sort of like the way that AM radio works, where you modulate the carrier frequency with the uh, information or voice or music that you're trying to transmit. So this, this odd firingness of the engine is modulating the fundamental frequency. So on the engine crankshaft, the speed varies and is concentrated. The variational frequencies are concentrated at these spikes. And if one of those spikes lines up with the resonance, say of that rotor, like at 18 Hertz or 33 Hertz or 34 Hertz, um, the engine will excite these modes. And if there's no damping, um, destruction results. So V belts have a lot of damping in them. Um, a lot of times that's all you need. Uh, tooth belts on the other, on the other hand, do not have as much damping. And that's why they have so much more trouble with, uh, destroying drive systems on hovercraft. But in the case of this fan rotor, uh, the V belt wasn't quite going to do it. So I built a, uh, one dimensional model in AIMSIM, the product for doing these kind of analyses and came up with a, a coupling design between the engine and the rotor. So here it is um, on the engine. It's got, let's go to the next slide here. Got three shit or three grooves in it. Uh, one for the cross low rotor number one, and then cross low rotor number two. And the middle one is for the lift fan eventually. It's gonna be driving the lift fan. So the way this works is that the spindle, the pink part, fits on that tapered crankshaft. This engine came from a generator, so it came with a tapered shaft. And on the right end, I'm oh, sorry, on the left end, there is a uh, coupling dry flange that's welded to the spindle. And this rubber coupling, if you look over on the right, has four aluminum inserts in it. So you drive two of them and you take the drive off the other two that are all 90 degrees apart. So this flange drives the rubber coupling which then drives the, uh, the sheave. And in between the sheave and the spindle are two nylon bushings, those blue things that lets it rotate. So it doesn't really spin on there, but it when it's running, it oscillates back and forth, probably like a, a fraction of a degree. 
absorbing the, the vibration from the engine so it doesn't get to the fan and cause problems. So where is this project now? Well, I've hung it up, literally. It's hanging from the ceiling in my shop. It's a quick summary. Um, advantages, it is very quiet, not quite as quiet as, say, Keith Oakley's um, quiet one craft, but it's pretty good. Um, very low tip speeds in the rotor. So both safe and because it's low speed and the blades are lightweight too. So if they do fail, they're not going to do much damage. And the thrust line is very low and the whole device is low. So you can fit underneath bridges and, or low trees and so on with your hovercraft. And it, it provides for differential left and right thrust or reverse thrust. And you can modulate your thrust with a single engine craft by operating the nozzles instead of changing the engine RPM. And it's a pretty good producer of thrust. Uh, the problem is that it's kind of bulky. So you can't really fit the same amount of duct area, if you will, on the craft with this cross hole fan as you could with a, a large um, slow turning thrust duct that you would normally have. So you have less area, but it uses the area more efficiently. So it's sort of an even trade off as far as that goes. A little bit heavier than a normal thrust duct and it's a bit more work to make. So for future efforts, um, I'm gonna build a hovercraft deal with fellow Hover Club of America member, Terry Chapman, who lives near me. And his son, Chris Chapman, is working on electric nozzle and reverser actuation. So it'll be coordinating the, the height of the nozzle and the reverser blocker door and so on. And once we have all that working, then I'll go ahead and build the right hand fan, the other half. I think, if there's going to be a next generation, uh, areas for improvement would be the blade geometry and, and also having less of them, so it's less work to produce. And go beyond the home built construction technologies, so you make stiffer, stronger blades that are lighter, less bulky, and less fragile. And also, the, uh, the shapes of the cutoffs in the housing where they meet the rotor, those can probably have some further refinement to reduce some more noise. Well, that's all I know on this. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the tech talk. Uh, thank you for watching and happy hovering.